What is your will? And we don't always know how to go about that. So we ask you for wisdom and discernment. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. First of all, I welcome each of you. We're pleased to have you here and certainly appreciate your attendance. Obviously, you have an interest in increasing the effectiveness and efficiency of your giving and related uh, charitable efforts. I know that you're excited, as I am, by Dr. Lupton's input from his on-the-ground practical experiences. And having already heard him speak today, I'm certain that we'll leave here tonight both energized and challenged. Many of you know that the Waccamaw Community Foundation is primarily focused on helping individuals and companies with their charitable giving. And in that regard, we're very devoted to our donors. However, the Community Foundation's current leadership also believes that we have an important role in facilitating action that addresses significant community issues. Right now, one of the significant issues is our homeless population in the city. And that is why we've partnered with the city of Motor Beach in seeking to improve efficiencies assisting the homeless in our area. So we thank the city of Motor Beach for its efforts in addressing the homeless issue and assisting in bringing Dr. Lufton here tonight, today, because he's actually been in sessions all day today, for those of you that aren't aware of that. And of course, again, we thank the First Presbyterian Church for hosting um, this event. Uh, Pastor Carol indicated to me that I might remind you both of those of you that might need that. Uh, might have need of them um, that the restrooms are in the back um, the hallway. So uh, anybody that might, might have that need. The ladies on the right and the men on the, on, on the other side. Um, as a brief introduction for Dr. Lovin, he has a PhD in psychology from the University of Georgia. Well, if you don't know anything else about him, you would know he's a down-to-earth guy because he continues to use Bob as his first name in adulthood. And I can speak firsthand to the fact that there are not too many pompous Bobs around. <laughs> Dr. Bob Lupton's commitment to helping others is both exemplary and extraordinary. He left a successful business career with the, to work with delinquent urban youth in Atlanta, and he's invested the last 40 years serving in the inner city of Atlanta. Those experiences over the 40 years have taught Dr. Lupton some applicable life and giving lessons, and he'll share those with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lupton. Disadvantaged backgrounds. 
uh, that I interacted with over there, and um, kids that had significant issues. And so I was able to help some of those kids uh, get their high school GED diplomas, and uh, we did an amnesty drug use program for kids that really got to strung out and move your heroin over there and went to the home. And so it ended up being a year of, uh, of service for me. And so when I came back to the States, came back, back to my business career, I had this, what, what I believe was a calling to find a way to work with troubled young men. I went to the, the judge in our juvenile court system in Atlanta and told him this idea. And uh, he actually was not really all that impressed. Uh, he said, I've seen you religious types uh, come and go out of this court for five years. He said, frankly, I think you do more harm than you do. But he said, if you uh, want to work with some kids, I'll, I'll give you some campers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we did. And it became obvious very soon that I wasn't going to hurt them. Uh, but those kids came from very disadvantaged communities in Atlanta. And they began to teach me realities that I had never been exposed to before in my life. I realized over time that you could work very effectively with troubled kids apart from their family situation. And so uh, that prompted me to go back to school to learn how to work with families. And, and so I expanded, expanded what I was doing to include, include the families. Uh, only to discover that you can't work very effectively with struggling families apart from the environment that impacts on them every time they step up. And so that prompted me to get more involved with what was happening in the community, in the schools, in the street corners, the issues of uh, some violence on the street. And, uh, in time, it became apparent that if you were going to change an environment, you really needed to be a part of that environment. That's not something that you easily share with your wife. <laughs> Particularly when you're in the process of building a brand new home, a little farther out in the suburbs, closer to our suburban church. Uh, Matter of fact, we were about five weeks away from moving into our new dream home. And this feeling of you need to, you need to become involved intimately in the inner city community was just growing in me, but I kept it to myself. Uh, and I remember the night that it happened, uh, Peggy was, uh, we'd gone to bed early, she was excited, she wanted to talk. A lot of energy that goes into building a new home. We were in that process of selecting the, the cabinetry and the floor coverings and the light fixtures, high energy stuff. Peggy wanted to talk. I said, I don't think you want to talk to me tonight. And she said, what's wrong? And for the first time, I, I articulated this sense of calling that I felt God was asking us to move into the inner city and become a neighbor. That was a bad night. <laughs> Neither of us slept a lot. In the morning, uh, Peggy says, uh, is this your idea or God's idea? Because if it's your idea, I'm not interested. <laughs> and she said, I want it right from God if I could get it. 